driving you crazy with the grit of this of this laryngitis. So uh, maybe do what? How did I get it? Well, I we last week were with my daughter and son-in-law and grandbaby, and uh, we took them over to East Tennessee to go take them to Dollywood for the first time. And they were we all stayed in a RV together that we rented. And they were they kind of had the last legs of a cold, and so I got the cold, which didn't really have any. I mean, almost no symptoms, just tiny symptoms. But then what happens is once it was gone, this happens occasionally every couple of years to me. It just kind of, like I said, drops in my throat. And there's, not, it, there's nothing you can do about it. I feel great. And uh, just that happens. And so, you know, you just deal with it. You just deal with it. Okay. Well, we're in the book of, what are we? Leviticus in here, aren't we? Leviticus. And then um, the week after next, I won't be here next week. Um, I sure do appreciate Tim uh, filling in for me uh, while he's been, uh, while I've been away. He'll be filling in one more time. And uh, I know his lessons are complimentary, and I really appreciate that. And then I'll be back, and he'll be stuck with me for about six months. I ain't going anywhere, so... My next time I'm gone is like in September or something like that. So, uh, well, let's take a look at Leviticus. If you've got the handouts, if you didn't, they're out there. If you forgot, you, you can pick them up out there. Let me kind of uh, help you, remind you of an approach that I strongly recommend. And that is after we go through it here. And, of course, we're going to have kind of abbreviate things. You go home reread the lesson fill in the blanks and the answer of course all the words fill in the blank answers are in the the back page of the lesson and uh, in the scriptures you know I always provide four or five scriptures that are I think significant and key uh, read those uh, jot down in the margin that's a wide margin designed for your note taking jot down thoughts from those passages uh, what they say about God, uh, what uh, you think, uh, you know, how you should respond to it. Just, just some interaction with it. Okay, with that in mind, let's take a look at Leviticus. We've got about 25 minutes. So, well, I'm, I'm sure I'm not the only one who's, you know, resolved to read the Bible through a year and then it, the whole plan blows up in Leviticus. And, and the reason oftentimes it blows up in Leviticus is it's boring. It's just, it's just boring. Unless you're Roger Jenkins. Roger is all about spending hours reading regulations. And uh, so he gets into that. And so you got a book full of regulations, <laughs> Roger said. Hey, it's not boring for me. I love it. Mm -hmm. I love that. Um, but for most of us, it's like we'd rather watch paint dry. Uh, then read the book of Leviticus. Uh, you know, we, we came through Genesis, we came through Exodus, and we've got these edge of, your, each, uh, edge of your seat stories, and we've got all this great narrative. And we come then to the book of Leviticus, and we have no narrative, almost no narrative. Uh, it is just a bunch of laws. But as boring as it may be to read, it is really important to understand this is an important book as it's unfolding the plan of redemption. Um, and it really grows out of Exodus. You, you know, of course, you've got the book of Exodus here. And uh, in, as we looked at the book of Exodus, the last half of it, the tabernacle's built. And, and so what the book of Exodus is all about is God approaching man. God comes to live among his people and he wants to live among his people. It's what the tabernacle is all about. He wants to live among them. What the book of Leviticus is, is man's approach to God. So Exodus, man's, God's approach to man. Leviticus, uh, man's approach to God. And we need both books because they both have a complementary message. Um, what Leviticus shows uh, is that uh, God expects something 
from those with whom he has a relationship. If you want a relationship with God, God expects something. That's what Leviticus is all about. And so uh, as we think about that, uh, what does God expect for his people? Well, he really expects two things. And we see this in the book of Leviticus. Uh, he expects acceptable worship. And he ex uh, expects acceptable living. Uh, both of those things. And so that's what Leviticus is. It's, a, it's this book. It's got a bunch of laws and rules and instructions on how his people are to worship him acceptably. And how are they are to live morally and socially acceptably. And so let's talk about those things real quick. First of all, the first 16 chapters of the book of Leviticus are the laws about worship. Laws about acceptable worship. Uh, remember at the end of the book of Exodus, the tragedy of the golden calf. Moses is up on the mountain. He's coming down, and there they are dancing around the golden calf. And, and so uh, that reminded us of something really important we talked about. And that is that human beings are just sinners. We're just broken. And, and, and God is holy. So you've got broken sinners. You've got a just and holy God that can't tolerate sin. And so you've got this dilemma. And, uh, and so... It's not surprising then that as the book of Leviticus starts, it's going to open up with God telling his people, these bunch of sinners who are just so broken and so messed up, how they can commune with him, how they can worship him acceptably. And so in these first 16 chapters, uh, you've got laws on worship that deal with sacrifices and the priesthood and cleanliness. So let me real quickly say something about the laws that deal with sacrifices. Uh, you've got instructions basically for five types of sacrifices. Some of these sacrifices were to atone for sin. And, uh, and when God's people faithfully obeyed his instructions for carrying out these sacrifices, then it resulted in forgiveness. And they could enjoy the blessings of reconciliation with God. And um, that's important to understand. So you got that, that section, the sacrifices. Now, not all the sacrifices were to atone for sin. Some of the sacrifices were about gratitude, just opportunities for people to reflect on how good God has been to them. And it was a way of expressing to the God uh, their, uh, their thanks and their gratitude for his wonderful mercy and grace. And, and his wonderful gifts of every other blessing of life. Uh, then you have the laws pertaining to the priesthood. This is chapters 8 through 10. Up to this point, of course, as we see in Genesis and Exodus, uh, people like Abraham, they, they just offer personal sacrifices to God. But now we come to a different moment in history. And now God appoints Moses' brother Aaron and his sons and their descendants uh, to the priesthood. And so this is a very important role. And they're going to help God's people offer sacrifices. Now, they don't actually offer the sacrifices for the people. They assist the people. And uh, they help the worshipers uh, understand God's commands and how to obey God's commands. And so in this way, the role of a priest is really a mediator between man and God. You know, we know what a mediator is. You've got two parties and you've got someone kind of, okay, taking to each party, you know, what the other party is proposing and expecting. And so really you've got this mediating type ministry, this priesthood. And then you've got laws pertaining to cleanliness. Now, as a special nation, and that's what Israel is, a special nation. We saw that last week. As a special nation, a special relationship with God, they have to understand the difference between holy and common. Or some of the other words are clean and unclean. Now, when we get to rules about holy and common and clean and unclean, to be real honest, this is some of the most baffling to God's people. That we go, why is that? Because what God does is he takes this, you know, so many ordinary everyday aspects of life, childbirth, 
bodily functions, clothes, food, animals. And some of them make you unclean and some of them make you clean. And God doesn't really tell us why. Now, some people pointed out, well, now that what we know kind of scientifically and all, that uh, there's a lot of health advantages in some of the food restrictions and some of the uh, washing restrictions and all of that stuff. Well, yeah, that's true. And I think it's probably likely that that's part of what God had in mind. But it wasn't just about protecting them from any kind of, uh, particularly any kind of physical things. This had, this was, had spiritual repercussions. Being unclean limited their access to God in the community. And the bottom line is he doesn't give any real explanations and reasons why some things are clean and some things are unclean. Uh, he just says, these are my standards. And his people then are expected to obey those standards. Okay, so that's the first section of Leviticus. The first 16 chapters is laws about sacrifice, about worship. The second part of the book of Leviticus from chapter 17 through 27 is laws about acceptable living. That's how you divide up the book of Leviticus. Two things. Laws about acceptable sacrifice, acceptable worship, and then laws about acceptable living. Uh, so not only does God give extensive instructions for how his people are to approach and worship him, he also gives them extension, extensive uh, instructions on how they are to live. And there is no aspect of their life that escapes God's scrutiny and God's expectation, God's call to be holy. And that is the word. If you go, well, how are God's people to be live? How are they to live? The word is holy. We saw that. We'll see it again in the book of Leviticus. Be holy as I am holy. And, uh, and so what that means is God is holy and we are to emulate his character. Uh, that's what God wants from his people. And so whether it's talking about sexuality, whether it's talking about relationships, whether it's talking about business practices, uh, God's call for holiness extends into every facet of life, not only for his Old Testament community, but his New Testament community as well. Okay, now what you're going to see on your notes, and, you, and, and again, go back and reread these and fill in the blanks after the lesson sometime between now and next week. There are also two special days to remember in the book of Leviticus that are really important. One is the Day of Atonement. The other is the Sabbath day. Uh, the Day of Atonement is found in Leviticus 16. That really is the heart of the book. Uh, it is the heart of the book's teaching. And that's where God establishes the Day of Atonement. And it's commonly called in Jewish life even today, Yom Kippur. Uh, and it's the clearest picture that you're going to find in the Old Testament of God's grace through faith. It is God... Uh, and the graciousness of God on full display and the demand for faith. And so you see God's faith, uh, grace through faith uh, exercised here. Everything comes together in the day of atonement. God's holiness, God's mercy, Israel's special status as his special people, the need for forgiveness, uh, the need for purity, confession of sin, sacrifice, all of that comes together in the Day of Atonement. And it was on that day, many of you know this, and only that day, one day a year, that the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies. Two goats were chosen that would symbolize the sin of the people. One is sacrificed and his blood is sprinkled on the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, it's over the Ark of the Covenant, the space above that, that was the mercy seat where God's presence in a very special way dwelt among his community. And one, one of those goats was sacrificed and the blood was put on the Ark of the Covenant. And then the other one, the high priest, lays his hands on the live goat, confesses the sins of the people. Goat's taken out into the desert where, you know, presumably it's going to die uh, with all the sins of the people loaded on it. And that goat's called the scapegoat. In fact, we use that word still today, a scapegoat. Um, and after this, atonement has been achieved. 
And God's wrath has been turned away. Remember, God is holy. And in his holiness, he has to consume sin. Uh, But wrath is turned away here on the Day of Atonement. And there's no condemnation. There's no guilt. And the people then can just rejoice in the fact that they've been reconciled to God. The second day that's important to remember in the book of Leviticus, Leviticus is, I said, the Sabbath day. Uh, This is a week-by-week reminder uh, that God's a holy God and they're a holy people. And, And so, you know, of course, in Genesis, we see God creating on seven days. He creates in six days. He rests the seven. And we wonder what's up with that. Well, we learn as we get to the end of Leviticus, or the book of Exodus rather, and then into Leviticus, that God was setting up a, a, a model for a, a pattern that ultimately uh, Israel was going to follow. And, and part of that pattern was one day a week they're going to stop working. And it's a reminder. It's a reminder that Israel is no longer slave to the Egyptians. It's a reminder that they are not only not slaves to the Egyptians, but they're not slaves to their own work either. And uh, it is important. Uh, it is an important part of staying in communion with God. Um, for faith to grow, uh, God's people have to stay in communion with Him. And for that to happen, uh, we have to understand that our life and the people of Israel needed to understand this, that their lives don't revolve around and doesn't just merely consist of work and money and power and success, uh, that the greatest fulfillment is in the relationship with God. And so God sets aside this day for them every day or every week uh, to remind them that they belong to God and it would facilitate that communion that would stimulate the growth of their faith. You know, in a lot of ways, that's uh, what the Lord's Day, He still causes people to come together on a certain day, once a week. Uh, That's important. It's very important. It's important to remind us, it's a perpetual reminder that our life has to be uh, about more than work, money and power. Now, it doesn't mean we can't do any work on Sunday. We know that the, all the tenets specifically of the old law and the Sabbath law doesn't apply to that. But nevertheless, you see this, uh, this uniqueness of a special day to come together when we can. I mean, we know that some people in their jobs, some things have to be staffed 24-7 police and firemen and EMTs and hospital workers, but, but the idea is to for that moment. So these are two important days. Okay, let's take a look at the lessons of Leviticus. Now, now what I'll do, beginning on page 31 of your handouts and in your notebook, I will tell you right now each of the blanks so you can fill them in. Here are the lessons. Lots of lessons from the book of Leviticus. Uh, I picked out a few. Uh, First one, your first bullet here on page 31, the bottom page 31, the first lesson is God is holy. The book of Leviticus is all about the holiness of God. I'm going to tell you, by the way, from here on out, every with every lesson, we're going to have a statement about God that relates to that book. I got this idea from, uh, and I really stole this guy's, uh, Dr. Paul House, who's a uh, professor of Old Testament theology, used to be at Southern Seminary where I went to school. Uh, I don't know if, if Dr. House is still there, but he wrote a book on Old Testament theology. And, and for each book, he has a God he is at the beginning that relates to the content of the book. I loved it. So I want to start incorporating that. So uh, what do we learn about God in the book of Leviticus? What's the God is statement for the book of Leviticus? God is holy. That's, that's what the book of Leviticus is all about. God is holy. And uh, it is just emphasized over and over and over in the book of Leviticus. And, you know, God's emotional reaction against sin uh, comes because he's holy. He's holy. He's sinless perfection. And he hates sin because he's holy. Second lesson that we have, second bullet statement there, 
Man is, here's your blank. Man is sinful. God is holy. Man is sinful. Sin affects every category of human being. The rich, the poor, the priest, the lay person, all transgress God's will. You know, the high priest, we said, goes into the Holy of Holies once a year. But before he can go into the Holy of Holies, he has to deal with his own sins. It's not like, oh, he's the high priest. He's not like us. Oh, he's the high priest. And he's just like the people in the sense that he's a sinner. And so for him to come into the presence of God, he has to be atone- his sin has to be atoned for. And so every category of human being is a sinner. Third bullet statement. This is the top of page 32. Should be the top of page 32 in your lesson. Sin, which is the transgression of God's will. Sin separates us from God. Sin separates us from God. Since God's holy, and since we're sinners, sin prevents us from uh, from fellowship with God. Now, if you look back in your last lesson, as we looked at the book of Leviticus, I mean the book of Exodus, rather, let's see, on page 25, we didn't get it really on your handouts, we didn't really get a chance to talk about it, but this is your diagram of the tabernacle. And one of the things that we pointed out that was so important to remember is the presence of the tabernacle, God's tent in the middle of the tents of the people is a reminder God wants to be with his people. He wants to communicate with them. He wants to commune with them. He wants to speak to them, and he wants them to speak to him. But at the same time, the way the tabernacle is set up, it reminds us that not only is God in the middle of us, but there's a boundary between us and God at the moment. That fence that you see there in verse 25 that surrounded the actual temple, the tabernacle, the, the, the sanctuary itself, is about 150 feet long on each side, about 75 feet wide, and it was about seven and a half feet tall. And so it's just tall enough to where, even though the people could always look and they could see the tabernacle in the middle of their camp and the presence of God, cloud or fire, And know that God's among them. At the same time, it's designed that uh, you just can't really see into it very well. It's a reminder that there's limits. There was only one way into it. You had this one opening here uh, on the east side. And as you first came in, you have this, the, the, the bronze altar that's there. And, and it's a reminder that as we're approaching God, we have it's going to be it's going to cost because we're sinners, and and the first thing to approach God in any way, re, it requires uh, something's got to die, and so this separation is not only does God desire to be present among His people, is that reflected in the tabernacle, but the fact that uh, man is separated from God. Uh, because he is a sinner. God's holy man's sinner. Sin separates us from God. The fourth bullet statement, I just said that. The solution is, here's your blank, costly. It's costly. God has to pour out his holy wrath on sin. And so for there to be forgiveness, there has to be death. Another thing that we re- uh, learn from the book of Leviticus, an important lesson here, the fifth bullet statement, is obeying God is, here's your blank, obeying God's mandatory. It's mandatory. Obedience has always dis- demonstrated trust in God. It's always demonstrated trust. It's always demonstrated faith. Those who trust God will obey God. They will aspire to obey Him to the best of their ability. That's what faith looks like. That's what trust looks like. Uh, next bullet statement. God we learned this from the book of Leviticus. God reveals what, here's your blank, pleases him. God reveals what pleases him. The only way we can know what pleases God is for him to tell us. Look, the Israelites have very little knowledge of how to worship God and how to live for God. They've been living in Egypt. They've been living among pagans. And, um, you know, their sense of morality was terribly distorted. And we know that from the whole golden calf episode. We don't know what pleases God. We might think we do, and a lot of people do. A lot of people think they can intuit it. 
oh, I think God would like this. Wait, wait, we're sinners. We dance around golden calves. If we want to know what pleases God, God has to tell us. And he tells us. And that's a lesson from the book of Leviticus. Um, the next bullet statement, God blesses faithfulness is your blank. God blesses faithfulness. God wants to bless. He longs to bless. Uh, but his blessing is tied to loyalty. And that is the message that we find all through the book of Leviticus. Next bullet statement. The sacrificial system. Your blank is sacrificial. The sacrificial system looks forward to Jesus. As you go back and read this lesson this week, you'll also want to read Hebrews chapter 9. It's here in your notes. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 1 through 15. It mo- makes the most extensive use of the Day of Atonement that's found in Scripture. The Day of Atonement was a picture of a greater sacrifice that was still to come. You know, as I said, when the people went through the Day of Atonement, their sins were atoned for and they could rest and take joy in reconciliation with God. But what they didn't know was it wasn't really those goats that were bringing the reconciliation. Because the blood of bulls and goats can't do it. But they did really receive atonement. But it wasn't the blood of those goats and bulls. It was the fact that those blood, that blood, that sacrifices look forward to the ultimate sacrifice. And we know from the book of Hebrews that it was really the blood that reaches all the way back in human history. They were forgiven. They were just forgiven on credit uh, because God knew what he was going to do. Uh, the Christ would go to the cross and forgive. Okay, uh, the last two blanks here on lessons. God's in charge of your, here's your blank, God's in charge of your personal life. We're reminded of that in the book of Leviticus. He demands holy living. Uh, God's holy. Anyone who wants to have a relationship with him has to emulate his character. And, uh, you know, God imposes on his people a complete pattern of moral and social behavior. And that's not just Old Testament stuff. He imposes a pattern of moral behavior on us uh, in the New Covenant as well. But we got to emulate his character. And last, the last bullet, God is in charge of two blanks here. God is in charge of worship. That's your first blank. And there are acceptable and unacceptable ways to worship. Well, like I said, if God led his people direct worship, we'd always be putting ourselves at the center of worship. That's what we do. We're sinners. And we'd be dancing around the golden calf. That's what we do. We're sinners. And so God remains in charge of worship. And we see that especially in Leviticus chapter 10, in the first three verses, where Nadab and Abihu offers unauthorized fire to God. And God says, after he takes care of them, he says, uh, uh, I will be holy among my people. Uh, you, you do respect my holiness. And, and so with that in mind, look down at the bottom of page 32, four key passages that I chose. I'll choose anywhere from four to six each week. Go home and read these passages. And like I said, meditate on them. Jot down here in your little margins where you can write, jot down impressions about God or lessons for us. Well, listen, thank you so much for being here today. I hope you have a wonderful rest of the day. And Lord willing, I'll see you at 6 o'clock tonight.